Again, good morning. In case you don't know me, I think everybody knows who I am, but I'm Stan Sauer. I'm the elder chair here at First Christian. I had a call from Jacob this morning, and it, he's probably going to be you know, fine and everything. I don't want to freak anybody out. But he just wasn't, the, the term he used, I'm having a hard time getting on my feet. So he probably needs a little bit of tender love and care, get back, back in the groove. Jacob's preaching this five minor prophet series, and then he's going to preach again this fall and take the, uh, I think there's five more, and do a total of ten. So you can see on the slide there's several guys up there. You can go back to that first, yeah, stay on that one for a second. So, and I got to tell you, I couldn't have done the other four that he did. The Obadiah, the, um, I'm not even sure I remember them all. But I would have had no shot. However, interestingly, Jonah is the one minor prophet that I've done before. I've actually preached it before. Um, I know a little bit about Jonah. And I think what God wants to say through this prophet to us, and hopefully via the Holy Spirit, that some of that will come through this morning. In case you're wondering, we've all heard, we went, if you went to Sunday school, you heard about Jonah. And when they teach Jonah at Sunday school, he gets swallowed by the big fish, and God rescues him and spits him out on the shore, and there's always a fish. In fact, there, if they were teaching Jonah this morning, there'd be a big fish, and they'd be going through it. It's not just a story. It really happened, believe it or not. And how do we know it really happened? Because Jesus, in Matthew 12, 39, mentions Jonah specifically. And not only does he mention Jonah specifically, it's, he says, "Just I'm going to show you a sign. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall I, the Son of Man, be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. So if Jesus mentions Jonah and mentions being swallowed by the fish, there is no doubt it happened. It's a very, very amazing story, very amazing that a uh, person could be inside of a, could have been a whale, could have been any kind of monstrous fish, but it's an amazing thing. To me, and I think hopefully Jacob was trying to get this, I have his notes and we'll see if I preach any of them or not. But the story of Jonah, there's no other, this book reveals two things, the heart of God and the heart of a person. How we think as sons and daughters of God in our flawed, sometimes challenged ways, it reveals a lot about how we think. And more importantly, it shows us how God thinks. A merciful God, always willing to show mercy. The other, the other prophets warned their people they were proclaiming to Sometimes over a number of years, repent, turn. God wants to be merciful to you. Please listen. And when they didn't listen was, was when the judgment finally came. But they had so many chances. And that's the heart of God. Who agrees? God gives us so many chances. And says, hey, knock, knock. I'm here. I'm trying to get your attention. And... What, what we know and what we'll see in the story of Jonah is oftentimes that attention is minor to begin with. And I, I used to tell my kids when they were growing up, you choose the hard way or the easy way. The easy way is listening at the beginning and obeying. The hard way is consequences. And God tells us that all the time. You want the hard way or you want the easy way? And what we often do is we say, my way is better than your way. That's the hard way. And, and then we get consequences come, and it gets hard, and, and then we're, we're mystified. Why is it getting hard? Maybe I should be listening. Anyway, enough of that. So this one's a little bit different. It's more about Jonah, and it's more about God, and it's a little bit about Nineveh who he was asked to go preach to. 
there's a little bit of a reversal of roles. In this book, the prophet rebels against God. Instead of the people, it's the prophet. The sailors and the idol worshipers that are on the boat end up repenting and turning to God. And the bad nation repents and laments. That's different. And then the prophet complains about their repentance and their acceptance. So this one's totally different than the other four. And thankfully, like I said, I actually know a little bit about this story, so I'll probably add lip a whole bunch. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Ninevites. They were Assyrians. They were bad people, pretty much always. The Assyrian Empire was the definition of unrestrained cruelty. When they would conquer a city, they would frequently impale men, steal from women, burn children, torture survivors. They had a habit of chopping off hands, ears, and noses. Many times they would remove eyes. Sorry, I didn't know this was in here, and I'm reading it for the first time. I apologize. Um, I might skip some of that. Where they would usually die as slaves. Their cruelty is well documented throughout the Bible. Even in ancient archaeology, sometimes they are cited as the appalling lords of torture. Why would God show mercy to people like that? That's a question we need to ask ourselves this morning. Would you bring me my phone up here, please? Sorry. I'm going to have to ad ad lib a bunch, but um, anyway. So here's these horrible Assyrians, horrible Ninevites, and God's plan is, I'm going to pluck Jonah, and he's going to go preach against them, tell them they're horrible, and tell them they're going to be judged. And Jonah says, I don't want to do it. I'm not part of your plan. Pick somebody else. I'm not your guy, and he runs. I highly recommend, this is a bad strategy. If God asks you to do something and you run the opposite direction, that is a bad strategy. You know why it's a bad strategy? Because you can't run from God. You can't run from his Holy Spirit. You can't run from his angels. He will come find you. Do you know how many people there are in this world right now running from God? too many. They need our words, our encouragement, our help to say, what are you doing? Why are you running from the Lord? This is not a good place for you to be. He's going to bring you back one way or the other, the easy way or the hard way, but he's going to try to bring you back and he's going to try really, really hard. The heart of God tries to restore everybody. We know, I know, you know, prodigals in your life. People that have the inheritance and they've said, I'm going to go do my thing with this inheritance. I don't need God. I don't need my family. There's people running away from their own families. Can you believe that? It, it breaks my heart when I hear those stories. And God wants to restore running people. People that are trying to get away from Him. His heart is Come back. Come back to your family. Come back to me. I'm merciful. I think a lot of times people think that God is the dude with the big mallet and that I can't approach him because he's going to bonk me on the head because I've committed all these sins. They look at where they've been and the things that they've done and they say, he'll never take me back. That's not true. He will always take you back. He's not there. The punishment and the, the correction comes when you're running. The open arms and the heart of God comes when you come back. And you know, I don't know if you're watching online or if it's you or you know somebody, but he's saying, come back. Come back this morning. Come back to me. The punishment he took on the cross it's not for you, for your sin. He took it on the cross. And you can just say, like the prodigal did in the pigsty, 
what am I doing here? There's so much better in my father's house. I'm going back. I'm going back to my father's house. And we all know the story, and Jacob probably didn't think I was going to preach on the prodigal son today. Too bad. When he comes back, the fatted calf, and there's all welcome. And that's waiting for everybody that's willing to say, I repent. I, I'm doing it my own way. I want to do it your way, Lord. I feel bad for the guys doing the slides because they have no idea where I'm going. So don't run from trouble. And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit part of the story too. So Jonah ends up on a ship and you might notice that all the songs this morning are about water and ship. You know, you can kind of tell there's a theme. But he ends up on this ship and everything's fine and he's, you know, hey, I've run from God and so far I'm successful. And the huge storm hits and the sailors are like, what is going on? There's something wrong here. God's trying to judge us. Something's bad. Uh, wind and the waves are hitting. Uh, somebody's doing something they're not supposed to do. There's a shock. Uh, many times we see this in our lives where you say, somebody's doing something they're not supposed to do. And things are, things are going bad. And it's okay to ask the Lord, am I doing something wrong? Is somebody doing something wrong? Because we need help. And Jonah fesses up and says, I'm sorry, but I'm running from God. And they throw him off the ship, should have died, would have died. God has not given up on the plan for Jonah. And he may be as far away from Nineveh as he tried to get, but he hasn't given up. And he sends a big fish. We don't know what kind of fish it was. We imagine it's a whale. Swallows him. <laughs> that Sunday school slide. Um, goes into the belly of the fish three days, three nights, for two reasons. One is a sign for Jesus to use. Let's not forget Jesus used it. The other is, this is his chance to repent. This is the ultimate get Jonah's attention. And so he's inside the fish, and he, he's like, oh, I messed up. I shouldn't be in here. You're, you're kind, God. Oh, why am I in here? What, what's happening? And uh, he knows his soul's down to the pit. And the fish spits him out onto dry land. And I'm actually going to read a couple passages here. This is, I'm actually going to read quite a bit of Jonah 3 and part of 4. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh the Great, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jacob got up, went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days walk. And Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed God. They called a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the dust. And he issued a proclamation. In Nineveh, by decree, the king, his nobles, no person, animal, or flock is to taste anything. You can't eat or drink. But every person, animal, must be covered with sackcloth, and people are to call on God vehemently, and they are to turn each one from his evil way and from violence which is in their hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, turn from his burning anger, so that we will not perish. Their animals put on sackcloth. This is how serious they took this. And Jonah didn't even tell them they had a chance to repent. He didn't say, he's going to wipe you out unless. He just told them he was going to wipe them out. But the people, what do we have to lose? 
We're going to repent. We're going to ask God to be merciful on us. And they do it. And they do it so forcefully. They fast. They put on sackcloth and ashes. They, they call on God and they say, we're going to turn from our evil ways. Maybe God will turn and relent. Maybe he'll turn and relent. When God saw their deeds and that they turned away from evil, then God relented the disaster which he declared he would bring to them. So he did not do it. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in anticipation of this, I fled. And since I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in mercy, and one that relents from disaster. So now, please take my life from me, for death is better than life. <laughs> Jonah says to God, why did you waste my time preaching to Nineveh? Jonah... You knew he was merciful. You knew he would relent. And yet you didn't want to be the person that helped make that happen. Instead, you ask God, why are you wasting my time? Heaven help us if that's us. We ask ourselves so many silly questions about why would I preach to that person that looks like they would never accept God in a million years? Why would I... I'm probably driving Steve crazy because I'm walking around. Um, why would I waste my time? Or they're not going to listen to me. People don't want to hear about Jesus. People, people don't want to hear the gospel. They're tired of hearing the gospel. They know the gospel already. The greatest gospel you have that everyone wants to hear about is your life and what he did for you. If you don't know where to start preaching, someone, preaching to someone about the gospel, tell him what he did for you. That's all you have to do. I was lost. I was a Jonah. I was a prodigal. Whatever your story is. And say, he found me. Pulled me out of a pit. And he can do the same thing for you. That's the gospel. That he died on the cross for our sins. And we can be forgiven. And we can have eternal life. And we can live every day with him and for him. And no matter what you've done previously, he can... Step into your life and change it. The greatest miracle I've ever seen, and I've seen a few, is a changed life. And you know it when you see it. When you see somebody that isn't walking with God and comes, becomes a Christian and their life changes, you know that's a miracle. You know that only God can do that. There's some people that you've known in your life that, that are walking now and you say, that's God. That's only God. There's no way that could have happened. Maybe they're addicted to something and suddenly they're free. And you go, that's God. God did that. Or their personality completely changes. And you say, that's God. God did that. And we want that for so many people. We want to understand that we're and this is what I was talking about at the beginning, we're not naturally mercy givers a lot of times. When that person cuts you off in traffic, you're, not, you're so tempted to not give mercy to that person. You might mutter under your breath. You might be a little aggressive in your driving. We're not natural mercy givers, but God is. And he wants... He wants to impart our ability to give other people mercy. In the Gospels, it talks a lot about how you get people's attention. And it says, bless those that curse you. 
give things to people that, that do bad things to you. And that's what God wants. They, he wants people to say, I've been mean to you, I've done bad things to you, and all you do is bless me. What's wrong with you? And what's wrong with you is you have Jesus in your heart. And you want that opportunity to tell people, if I show mercy where mercy's not deserved, then that's going to get people's attention. And that's what God really wants from people, is merciful people showing his merciful heart and telling our stories to people. And, you know, Jonah's in the Bible. Jesus references Jonah. He makes some mistakes, but he's God's man. Regardless of what he did, he's still God's man. And God used him. God references him. And, you know, part of, part of what we're sharing this morning is don't be a Jonah. But Jonah did some things right as well. And I'm sure that throughout his life, he served the Lord. So don't have that attitude. Don't have that attitude of, I know better than God. I'm going to run. I'm going to do my own thing. And yet, um, we know God's heart. We know how merciful he is. And I just want to look at Jacob's closing so I don't totally botch this. The truth is God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. His mercies are new every morning. So maybe you are like Jonah and have been running from God. The mission that God has given you. Maybe God's mercy is something that you eagerly grab for yourself but are slow to offer others. Maybe you have a hard time believing God's mercy is given for you. Whatever the case may be, we're going to take communion this morning and come to his table. We say again, although we fall short, the Lord never does. His mercies are new every morning, and even when we don't feel like we deserve them, maybe we pass the elements, and that's what we're reflecting on this morning.